Hello, Prestige Heads, and welcome to American Prestige. I'm Danny Bessner, here as always with Derek Davison. I'd like to apologize in advance. My mic is not working. That is why I sound so good, and especially want to apologize to our editor, Jake. Um, but thank you all for listening, and Derek, how's everything going? <laughs> uh, my mic is working okay, so I think I'm doing all right. Stop bragging. Um <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot going on in the world. Um, and of course, the, the thing that has really um, swept uh, all of our thoughts is the Russian-Ukraine peace talk. So Derek, what's been going on there? Uh, so there have been a couple developments since last week's show. Uh, one on Friday, uh, the Russian Defense Ministry put out a statement uh, wherein they said that the main objectives of the first stage of their military operation have generally been accomplished, and they will now focus their core efforts on achieving the main goal, the liberation of the Donbass. Uh, this is all kind of interesting because it's unclear what objectives they've actually accomplished, if any. But what they seem to be saying here is that they have... Uh, they went in intending to degrade the Ukrainian uh, military as much as possible uh, and then shift, kind of downshift from a general invasion to a more focused operation that was just uh, centered around uh, probably not just the Donbass, despite their wording, probably the Donbass and let's say Mariupol and that southeastern coastline of Ukraine. Whether this comports with what the Russian war aim has been all along or is an indication that uh, they feel like they're not getting anywhere uh, with, uh, let's say, overthrowing the Ukrainian government or any wider aims and they've decided to uh, make a pivot while kind of, you know, retaining some uh, level of deniability to say that this is what we were intending to do all along is unclear. I'm not going to try to say one way or the other, um, but certainly, you know, those are both possibilities. Uh, now that feeds into. Uh, so, well, go, no, go ahead, Danny. Sorry. So, so I was going to say you don't know what you're. You're unwilling to make a prediction about whether this is real or not. I mean, well, I think it's real, but the, the the and there there's evidence, you know, today even the U.S. military is saying they've seen some pretty major troop movements around Kiev that suggest the Russians are pulling forces back. But I I I, I can get into that after we talk about these peace talks. So I mean, I think the 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 shift in their their operations is real. I'm not sure I I know why they're doing it. Um, and my hotline to the the Kremlin's still not working for some reason. So, um, you know, we'll just have to say it's happening, and, and I don't really know why it's happening at this point. Um, but but it feeds into Danny, as you uh, talked about the peace talks. Uh, there was another round of face to face peace talks on Tuesday this week uh, in Istanbul, uh, and I should note that we're recording this Wednesday evening, so there's going to be a lot of time in here before the episode comes out for things to have changed and uh, you know apologies if, if anything we say is out of date um but i never was apologize. Not that's just derek <laughs> i i specifically <laughs> not apologizing <laughs> all right yeah never apologize never apologize. never apologize uh, um so uh there was a big flurry after this uh after these this round of peace talks uh in istanbul that they'd made you know the two sides have made Huge progress, you know, tremendous kind of uh, uh, movement. And a lot of this was, um, this kind of cheerleading was being done by uh, Turkish officials, for example, who have every reason to sort of trumpet the success of their own uh, peace talks. But um, what appears to have happened is that the Russians uh, said that they intend to reduce their military activity around Kiev and also around uh, Chernihiv, the, which is a, another... 
northern Ukrainian city that's been effectively besieged and has been, you know, taken, been battered pretty hard by uh, Russian artillery and airstrikes. They're going to step, they, they said they're going to kind of reduce their military activity in those regions. Uh, they characterize this as an effort to, and I'm going to quote here from the deputy Russian minister of defense, Alexander Fomin, uh, to increase mutual trust and create the necessary conditions for further negotiations and achieving the ultimate goal uh, of, you know, sort of a, a peace arrangement. Um, so that's, that's one area that's supposed to, we're supposed to believe is, is serious progress. Uh, on the Ukrainian side, uh, they went into these talks on Tuesday uh, talking about their willingness to accept except neutrality, basically, to, to agree not to join any military alliances, specifically NATO, but also, you know, other military alliances, uh, to agree not to have uh, bases on their territory that house foreign troops, uh, not to engage in military exercises with, uh, you know, other kind of partner militaries, except at you know, uh, in consultation uh, with Russia, it sounds like there's some some uh, latitude there. But again, this is where I kind of, you know, have, have some, uh, not concerns, but questions. Uh, they're only willing to do this if they get uh, a security guarantee of some kind. And the details of that security guarantee are not uh, fully available. It doesn't, you know, it's it's unclear, for example, what countries would be asked to provide this guarantee. It would be some group of Western uh, countries, basically. Uh, Turkey's been on the list. Uh, the United States has been floated. Canada, the UK. So, I mean, you know, all, all your favorites. Um, and it sounds like what what the Ukrainians are asking for is basically a NATO like commitment that if Russia were to come back two years from now or five years from now or whatever and invade Ukraine, that these countries would be treaty bound to come to Ukraine's defense. Uh, I find it very hard to believe uh, that the Russians would be willing to accept this. Uh, and yet that's that seems to be what's on the table. And as I say, this is being characterized as uh, you know, big step forward and, and progress. Uh, so basically, I mean, on these two points, w- what you have are the Russians announcing that they're going to do a thing, you know, pulling back forces from from Kiev and Chernihiv uh, that they're already doing, that they were probably already doing for military reasons so that they could refocus on the Donbass. Uh, so I'm not sure how much of a concession that actually is. Uh, and on the other hand, you, the Ukrainians are offering neutral status under terms that I'm not sure Moscow would be prepared to accept. Uh, The other issues at play here, the final status of Crimea and the Donbass, the the geographic sort of issues, uh, it doesn't sound like they're anywhere close to finding common ground. And the Ukrainians are talking about, uh, you know, proposing a 15-year process to determine the final status of Crimea, which seems to me to be, uh, you know, long since lost to Russia. I mean, there's no, I don't think there's any coming back from that. Uh, And then, you know, they, they've said some very vague things about talking about the final status of the Donbass, but even vaguer than uh, this sort of nebulous 15-year process. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm a little skeptical about how much progress is actually being made here. But, but again, you know, that's, that's just me. And I guess only time will tell, really, on this one. Yes. As I said, there is evidence of Russian troop movements in the north, but whether that's a gesture of peace or just, you know, they're being redeployed to the Donbass, uh, who knows? There is still right. this issue of the bulk of the Ukrainian military being deployed in the Donbass in a place where it would be relatively easy uh, for the Russians, uh, especially uh, uh, if they wrap up the siege of Mariupol, which looks like it may be in the final days or weeks they they they're they're in control it sounds like of about half the city and you know continuing to kind of press that that advantage Th- that that they could in theory maneuver themselves to surround this uh the ukraine most of the ukrainian military which is still in this region uh which would be a big game changer i mean it would be a a, a very serious um you know pill for the very bitter pill for the ukrainians to swallow on i think uh you know would would change the nature of the conflict if it happened um so th- there's still that f- floating around out here so i think i think things are still fairly unsettled at this point 
Very interesting, Derek. Well, th- well, thanks for giving us an update on that. Um, why don't we actually go over to uh, Pakistan, uh, where it looks like there might be a new prime minister, uh, the the ousting of uh, former rugby star Imran Khan. Yes, legendary rugby player Imran Khan. So, Is it rugby or cricket? Uh, it's cricket. Sorry. Oh, it's cricket. Sorry. Cricket. Sorry, yeah. Sorry. 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 Let me make. Let me make sure. Sorry. This is I'm, not I'm, a sports I'm a podcast. Sleep. We are not. It's sport. cricket. My apologies. It's Legendary sports, cricket star. Sports <laughs> Imran ball. Khan. Yeah, My it's apologies. Just, it's My it's apologies. sports ball. Whatever. <laughs> um, yeah. So Imran Khan has been um, in a little bit of trouble for a couple of weeks now. Uh, there is. Uh, there's been a move away from his uh, party, Pakistan uh, Tariqe Insaf, uh, by on the part of its coalition partners. They've been wavering about uh, continuing to support the government. Uh, there's been even some movement within PTI uh, of uh, a few legislators who may may be defecting or have already defected uh, to the opposition. This is all in advance of or was in advance of an expected no-confidence motion, which has now been uh, put forward by the opposition. Uh, Khan, at this point, uh, he needs, I think, uh, 172 votes, a simple majority, to defeat the no-confidence motion and remain in power, but he's only got, his coalition only controls 176 seats, so he can't afford to lose really anybody. Um, and survive this motion. Uh, so there is a, I would say, uh, probably better than 50% chance that um, in a week, it's it, the vote uh, on the conference vote, they're now, you know, they're sort of debating it or they're, they're going to start debating it on Thursday, I think. And then the vote has to come within a week after that. Um, I would say at this point, better than 50% chance that that he will not survive that vote. Um, politically, and they're not going to, you know, take him out and back and, and do anything to him, but uh, politically. No, no, for sure. But does this suggest, okay, so uh, how would you characterize Khan's foreign policy? And do you think there, this augurs anything in terms of how Pakistan is going to relate in the region? So Khan has been um, certainly no great pal of the United States. Um, he, he's moved Pakistan uh, further toward China. He's been... Uh, I think uh, was friendlier toward, let's say, the the, the Afghan Taliban. Uh, even then, previous Pakistani governments had banned, and Pakistan has been sort of a consistent um, backer, at least you know behind the scenes of the the Taliban. Um, but Khan, you know, Khan's base is rooted in um, a, a, a heavy. But to a heavy extent in, in uh, kind of Islamist politics. Uh, he had the support of the Pakistani military uh, when he came to power. He seems to have now lost the support of the Pakistani military. That's part of the reason why this no-confidence motion seems to be going forward, uh, is that there's a perception that he's lost the military support, and the military itself has come out and said, this is, you know, this is your business. We're not going to get involved. So... You know, he's he's been severely weakened, um, you know, even if he manages to squeeze through this vote, he's been politically severely weakened. Um, I would expect uh, if he does lose the vote, he's going to be replaced, at least initially, uh, by some kind of opposition coalition, uh, probably led by uh, the Pakistan People Party or maybe the uh, the Pakistani Muslim League Um which will, you, you know, these are two parties that don't historically get along all that well with one another, uh, but they, they've kind of, you know, oriented themselves uh, against Khan and positioned themselves kind of as, as allies in that sense. So they'll try to get along and see if they can uh, form a government to avoid a snap election. That That government would probably not conduct foreign policy that much differently than Khan has uh, at to this point. Um, it, you know, it may take a little bit less of a kind of indulgent line toward the Taliban, which would be interesting uh, in terms of Afghanistan. But, uh, you know, in terms of the, the U.S.-China relationship, I, I don't, or the U.S.-China kind of tug, you know, uh, back and forth uh, tug of war. I, I don't, I don't know that you're going to see that much difference. 
Um, so why don't we talk a little bit about Yemen? And it seems like there might be initial glimmers of a ceasefire. What's your take? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I'm not optimistic about this either. Uh, the uh, Yemeni rebels, the Houthis, Ansar Allah, whatever you want to call them, uh, over the weekend uh, announced a three-day ceasefire that was meant to be a kind of good faith gesture toward the... Uh, Saudis, I mean, you know, the Yemeni government technically, but the Saudis are really in charge of that uh, coalition. Um, This was supposed to be, I think, a good faith gesture toward the Saudis and also a nod toward the United Nations, which has been trying to negotiate a ceasefire for the month of Ramadan, the Muslim, uh, the Islamic holy month of Ramadan, uh, which is begins probably will begin probably sundown on on Friday uh, in most places uh, that would have been you know would be followed if if it took would be followed by uh, peace talks um, the Saudis uh, responded on Tuesday uh, by announcing their own ceasefire but that ceasefire was to begin Wednesday morning, just as the Houthi ceasefire was sort of wrapping up or getting into its last hours. It was open ended. It may have, you know, may have been intended to coincide with the, this Ramadan ceasefire that the UN is proposing. The Houthis rejected that. Uh, the rebel position is, has always been that they're not going to agree to a permanent ceasefire or even apparently an open ended ceasefire uh, unless the Saudis lift their blockade. Uh, of northern Yemen, the air, their air and sea blockade. Uh, the Saudis have so tried to to make the case or tried to make the argument uh, that what they want or what they're willing to do is to trade a ceasefire for lifting the blockade. But what the the rebels have been demanding is the blockade has to go first, and then we'll talk about a ceasefire. So it has to be a sort of precondition uh, to having, you know, to even discussing a ceasefire. Uh, The Saudis resist that. And so, uh, you know, we're here in a place where the two ceasefires overlap for a few hours on Wednesday, but the the rebel ceasefire is over. Um, I suspect that the Saudi ceasefire, although it's in place, will only last until the first uh, you know, missile attack or drone attack on Saudi Arabia. So, um, you know, this this is uh, they're sort of circling this idea of a ceasefire. There was also discussion of a a, a prisoner swap that was, uh, you know, the Houthis. I think the rebels portrayed and uh, as being much further along than it sounds like it actually is. Uh, so, there's some positive rhetoric and some positive piecemeal developments, but they're not coalescing into anything that suggests um you know something something good like really good is is at hand so uh i don't know it's it's worth watching but but i'm i'm skeptical that they're gonna all get on the same page here well uh speaking of other depressing news uh north korea's missile test it seems like there's been some development since we talked about it last week uh, yes. So last, uh, I believe it was last Thursday. Yes. The North Koreans tested a- an intercontinental ballistic missile. The uh, initial analysis suggested that this was a Hwasong 17, which is a missile they had not yet tested. They'd sort of put on display and people knew it existed. Uh, it's very large. It's the largest uh, kind of road tracked or, or, you know, one of these missiles that you can put on a, a vehicle and fire from the back of a vehicle. Uh, the belief to be the largest of those that that's ever, any country's ever produced. Um, large enough to uh, not only hit pretty much any place in the continental United States, uh, but also large enough to carry things like decoy warheads or multiple warheads to try and uh, thwart missile defense systems. So very potentially uh powerful weapon. Uh, It now looks like they may have faked the test. (laughs) Um, Not entirely. They didn't fake the test uh, entirely. But what it it sounds like, uh, what the South Korean military has concluded uh, at this point, uh, is that what they actually tested was a, a less advanced or less powerful ICBM, the Hwasong 15, uh, which they'd tested previously. They'd they'd already uh, uh, tested that, I think, a few years ago. Um, And that what they did was they removed the dummy payload or at least shrunk the dummy payload down uh, to such an extent that they could get 
this smaller, less powerful missile to behave the way that you would expect a fully loaded Hwasong-17 to behave in, in a missile test. Uh, this is all very convoluted, uh, but what the South Koreans believe happened uh, is that earlier this month, I think on March 16th, uh, that the North Koreans conducted what was supposed to be uh, a Hwasong-17 missile test. They wheeled out the actual missile, uh, they launched it, and it failed. It either didn't get off the launcher or it crashed right after, uh, right after takeoff. Um, so in, in a kind of scramble, I guess, to... Uh, not have this be a huge embarrassment. They then decided to uh, do this thing or to doctor up the uh, Huang Song 15, which they know works because they've tested it before, uh, and fire that off instead uh, a few days later so that they could claim that they'd uh, they'd done it. This is uh, this is also connected it's a good to... good plan. I don't see uh, anything yeah. that could possibly go wrong. Yeah, a, this is also connected to a very bizarre... Top Gunnish video that the North Koreans put out the day after the missile test on Thursday, uh, showing like Kim Jong Un in a leather flight jacket walking out in front of the missile, very slow motion, uh, kind of uh, uh, looking quite silly actually, uh, and you know personally observing the test and like looking at his watch to time it and all this uh, very bizarre stuff. Uh, th that video uh, according again to the south koreans and i think the the us is weighed in here as well uh looks like it was shot on a different day than uh last thursday's missile test because the weather uh conditions that are known to have prevailed in north korea uh on last thursday did not correspond with the weather conditions uh that were visible in this video so what may have happened is that they shot the video on March 16th when they were, you know, planning to do this, this Wasong 17 test. And then when that test failed, they just kept the video and redid the test uh, a few days later with this dummy mocked up. Uh, Hwasong 15, and they're trying to pass this all off as as one thing. Uh, again, this is this, but we're this all kind of convoluted. We're too it, it, for that, it all Derek. hangs on <laughs> kind of you know un, unclassified you know classified intelligence and uh, things that nobody can see outside of the South Korean military. But uh, that's you know that's sort of where uh, where things stand on that that missile test. Well, that's kind of like an interesting note to end on. I think we should end there. Uh, Derek, thank you as always um, for your hard work. Uh, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Hello, Prestige Heads, and welcome to your weekly American Prestige. I'm Danny Bessner, here as always with Derek Davison, and we are very, very happy to be joined by my friend Alejandro Velasco. Um, Alejandro is uh, a history professor at NYU, um, an expert in Venezuela, and he's also the author of Barrio Rising, Urban Popular Politics and the Making of Modern Venezuela, which uh, came out with UC Press in 2015. So Alejandro, thank you for joining us, particularly after such a dramatic night last night with the Oscars. We're recording this on Monday, March 28th, and it seems like the discourse, the take economy is going through the roof right now. The take economy? I've never heard that term. That's amazing. No, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, we really appreciate it, uh, particularly because we I don't think, Derek, we've done an episode on Venezuela. We've done one on Mexico, a few on Mexico, a few on Cuba, but we've never done one on Venezuela. We haven't so why done don't we one just... on Venezuela. And, and uh, just to, to build on what Danny uh, has said, uh, if there's any way that you can relate uh, modern Venezuelan history to Will Smith slapping Chris Rock <laughs> on stage at the Oscars. That would help us out a lot there with is search engines in we might get there. and uh, like SEO <laughs> type things. That would, that would be very helpful for us. So I appreciate that uh, just in advance. So uh, Alejandro, why don't we just start at the beginning? And one thing that I'd like you to do is just to situate Venezuela in the larger context of Latin America or South America, because we've talked about Mexico and that has a particular relationship to Latin America and the U.S., same for Cuba. So maybe if you could just situate like Venezuela, you don't have to go back to the beginning, but like where it sits, um, both in terms of the larger Latin American context, but also in terms of its relationship um, with the United States. Yeah, I mean, uh, that question starts and ends with one word, and that has to do with oil. <laughs> uh, Venezuela has been uh, 
a major oil producer all the way back from the beginning of the 20th century, um, which before then it had really been kind of a backwater um, small country. Um, yes, it had led independence wars in the 19th century with Simon Bolivar, but really broadly had been relegated to, to the margins. And it really wasn't until the beginning part of the 20th century when it emerges onto its own as, a, as what will become an, an oil powerhouse. Um, which is especially important for the United States because, as you know, as we know, most of the suppliers of U.S. oil uh, or oil to the United States are elsewhere in the region. I mean, Mexico, for instance, supplies, but but Venezuela provided for many, many decades um, a stable, cheap, and close by source of um, of crude. Um, that was important because it also structured the political relationship between the two countries. Um, in the 1950s, as a military dictatorship that um, had uh, thwarted and interrupted a nascent democratic project, Venezuela's first, um, and that was uh, supported by the Eisenhower administration. Um, then, after 58, and that um, that dictatorship was overthrown, um, the U.S. had to kind of pivot very quickly to forge a different kind of relationship with Venezuela. But helpfully, it was done so by, by the fact that Cuba, of course, was going in a more communist route and Venezuela was really billing itself, or at least its leaders after 58, democratic leaders were billing themselves as a, an alternative to communism. And so that was basically what their relationship was like through most of the second half of the 20th century. Tremendously close um, ties, political, diplomatic, economic, um, uh, between the United States and, and the so-called Punto Fijo governments um, until Hugo Chavez set our eyes on the scene in uh, 1998 after a series of dramatic uh, political and economic crises throughout the 80s and, and 1990s. And, you know, what's interesting about it, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, is that he doesn't in, uh, in, uh, initially emerge as a kind of firebrand anti-U.S. leader that eventually uh, he will come to um, truly really represent. At first, in fact, he had very cordial relationships with Bill Clinton. Um, you know, the other interesting tidbit to, to note there, again, in terms of the, the place of Venezuela vis-a-vis -vis the United States and, and the larger region, is that you know, as, as bad as sometimes relations got between Chavez and, and the United States, certainly under the Bush administration, um, oil never stopped flowing to Venezuela or to the United States from Venezuela. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the real place of Venezuela, certainly really the United States has everything to do with oil. So that brings us, I mean, like that, to, to be honest, and this definitely displays my ignorance, is like that, that I first really heard of Venezuela through Chavez, you know, and the whole war on terror thing and that George W. Bush is the devil and smells like sulfur. And this was, you know, like in the wake of Freedom Fries in 9-11, he really became one of the the enemies number one, even though I don't think he was ever part of formally that that esteemed group of the axis of evil. Um, I think Venezuela was able to, you know, sort of stand beyond uh, beyond that. But why don't we just get um, into it because you wrote a really excellent article on Chavismo and sort of the, the, the political movement that 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 um, coalesced around Chavez. And, you know, I think we're going to do a little bit of the classic historian thing is like, yes, it started earlier and was more complicated. Um, so why do you date Chavismo to the 19... 50s and what do you think is happening there and and maybe you could situate uh, Venezuelan politics a little bit because there's um there there's a couple of dramatic events in the 1940s there's a, I think two coups and then as you mentioned there's one in 1958 as well so why don't we just start there and we can kind of just have a conversation yeah no thanks so much I you know that that article um <clears throat> it's it sort of um uh, a beast of an article. It's 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 almost thirty thousand words. It's kind of like a, a very short book, um, and it's something I've been writing, uh, really going on almost three years. It, it started as a as a piece that was commissioned to me by the Oxford and Research Encyclopedias, and at the time they had given me a ten thousand word limit, and I quickly blew past that. But really, the the major challenge that I had in telling the story of Chavez and Chavismo was that, um, in a way, I. As somebody who is from Venezuela and also studies Venezuela, um, the entire saga of Chavez and Chavismo has occupied my entire academic, intellectual, and personal life over the last 22 years. Um, and so, for me, it was really kind of a it, it was it was kind of a personal project um, with high stakes, and the stakes basically are to try to, in a context that is tremendously polarized among Venezuelans, certainly, but also with anybody who has an opinion um, on Venezuela, whether they came to it in 2006 when Chavez made that 
you know, a UN speech or earlier or later, you know, it, it breeds massive passions that sometimes make any kind of um, actual serious engagement um, difficult to go by. So what I wanted to do with this piece is really provide as much of a context and background and an explanation for all the nuances and contingencies that all that often get alighted in the more polarizing um, sort of narratives of you know whether Chavez was a was a heroic you know leftist um, you know revolutionary or whether he was always you know um, a, 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 an authoritarian um, either in the making or well just stated um, and and break from some of those more facile narratives and part of that starts by as you said periodizing Chavismo in a different way than it's commonly understood. And most common interpretations basically, you know, either start in 1999 when he first took office in a landslide, or they go back a little bit further, they go to 1992 when he first staged a military coup against the then highly unpopular uh, presidency of Carlos Andres Perez, who had implemented a really serious set of um, neoliberal economic reforms, um, and then also presided over a massacre when people rose up in protest over those reforms. Um, but what I wanted to do was you know, think a little bit more about the rise of Chavez and the ideologies that informed his, um, his wanting to seek state power and to what ends. And really, that is a story that, as you said, goes back to the 1950s, certainly when he was when he was born, but at a time when, and this is what I do in the article, I basically say that, you know, in in important ways, Chavez embodied the apogee and the agony of the regime that was there before he came to power. The apogee insofar as he was a poor, you know, lower middle class, um, you know, darker skinned, um, you know, boy in uh, the Plains region of, of Venezuela and historically you know, impoverished part of the country that um, who joined his parents were, were, were teachers or quite humble, not destitute, but, but you know, humble. Um, and he joined the military in part because that was, uh, you know, an opportunity for some upward mobility in a context where in the 1970s, when he was, you know, a teenager and in, in his 20s, um, uh, that that was that was a, a desirable option um, in a in a rapidly growing Venezuela that was you know very oil rich at the time, um, and, and so it, but at the same time because of his background he stood outside of the kind of traditional establishment which was wider which was richer, um, and so he brought that sensibility with him um, to to the time in the military academy. The other thing that was very important to him was um, that once he he was a cadet he was sent to Peru. Um, and to Panama, where two sort of progressive type military um, rulers were trying to implement agrarian reforms and other kinds of reforms that really led him to think about, you know, the military not as a place where, as had been the case elsewhere in Latin America, had been a bastion of the right wing or, or you know, really brutal repression, but as, as a vehicle for kind of progressive reform in the spirit of Jacobar Benz in Guatemala um, or Perón in Argentina in the 1950s. Um, and then the final thing is that he was very much um, in part because of where he was coming from and the sort of the heartbeat of, of, of Venezuelan you know, traditional culture in the Llanos region, the plains. He, he was deeply inspired and motivated by Bolívar, Simón Bolívar, and a kind of Bolivarian ideology, which really held that... Um, that Bolivar's dreams for a united Latin America had been thwarted by, you know, conservative forces, um, you know, in, at, back at the time of Bolivar. And so you know, he, he felt this to be a, a, not only a nationalist project, but really a Pan-American one um, in Bolivar and sort of wanted to, to bring that to the full. And yet at the same time, he was a deeply contradictory figure. He loved baseball, loved the United States, wanted actually to become a professional baseball player in the, uh, you know, an MLB. Um, uh, you know, deep fan of, of, of the Yankees and the Mets. Um, and so, you know, he had all of these contradictory currents. Um, but what happened was when he graduated from the military academy, his first command was to go out and, um, and to, to kill the existing or the remaining uh, Marxist guerrillas. Um, who had been trying to overthrow democracy since the 1960s. Um, and he realized then quickly that actually the, the, the country that had been built as this, you know, expansive, um, you know, inclusive place where oil riches flowed broadly was not actually quite that way. Um, and that's when he began to, to think about and to, to organize an alternative that combined these various features, a kind of Bolivarian nationalism, uh, um, a reformist militarism, 
um, on the on on the other hand, um, in order to try to bring about a different kind of uh, Venezuela. So I wanted to go back there because otherwise, you know, people sort of imagine Chavez coming from somewhere from from out of nowhere. Or, um, or, or really having no ideological vision of his own before arriving to the presidency, and that's that's not quite the case. So, one question that I wanted to have, and this probably betrays my sort of U.S. centered focus, is, is the role of the military in Latin America. And you gestured toward a little bit, and obviously, in different countries, the military plays um, different roles. Um, so. What was the historical role of the Venezuelan military if if we, if you if we're going back to the 1940s and 1950s and and what type of institution was it in society and for you know most of the listeners who who are to this show who are based in the United States how how would you help them understand the sort of social role of the military which my layman's understanding is 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 that it's very different from the role that it serves in the United States yeah actually I mean so. You know the the military that 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 Chavez came out of in the 1960s and 1970s was very different from um, the military that had been there before. It was you know highly professionalized military. There were you know um, it, it was largely you know um, um, uh, subservient to civilian power, um, and that had been a real challenge and a struggle for democracy, um, because again, as I mentioned, it had been uh, the military had overthrown a democratic uh, project in 1945, um, and instituted a, 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 a military or 1948, and instituted a military dictatorship. Um, but the kinds of relationship that the military had to larger social projects was actually quite contradictory. In the nineteen, in the early part of the twentieth century, there was a um, a twenty seven year military dictatorship, which basically was able to thwart what had been the caudillista kind of rule, these regional warlords, which had really kind of made their mark in Venezuela in the 19th century and really kind of centralized control. Um, but again, with a very heavy hand, with very few you know, opportunities for political, you know, aperture or, uh, or political participation of, um, of, of, of masses of the people. Um, when he dies, Juan Vicente Gomez in 1935, there's a brief interregnum of military rulers who tried to bring about some popular political reforms, including um, in universal suffrage, including um, you know, legalizing political parties. Um, but those two were thwarted by other more conservative elements within the military and, and elite economic um, society in Venezuela. Um, that changes somewhat in the 1950s after this first democratic um, experiment um, is overthrown. The dictatorship of Marcos Perez Jimenez, who uh, takes power basically in 1948 and really cements power in 1952, has a vision of modernization for Venezuela that includes basically um, raising massive amounts of uh, popular sector neighborhoods or barrios, um, you know, shanty, tack, shant, uh, shanty towns, and building in their stead these gleaming um, you know, super story, super uh, block, uh, high, high rise. Um, high density buildings that were going to modernize the people and therefore also create a new modern Venezuela. And so there was this kind of, on the other hand, it was you know highly repressive dictatorship. So there was a social orientation to it in terms of its projects, but a deeply restrictive political um, and political orientation. Um, at the same time, in the context of the Cold War, what that military is able to do is basically to forge a very close relationship with the United States. And that relationship was maintained from the dictatorship to the democratic period um, after 1958. Although, again, with you know, a different visage in the context of, well, you know, the military should now remain in its, um, you know, in its uh, quarters. It shouldn't try to you know, exercise a significant role in politics. And it should really brand itself in contra in, con in contradistinction to others around the region. So broadly speaking, there were these contradictory currents within the military going all the way back to the early part of the 20th century. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Chavez. I think it was really helpful that you gave a, a praise see, of his type of intellectual development and his social origins. But I want to talk a little bit about the 1970s. He's someone who's born in 1954, and he comes to really political age in one of the, I mean, I guess every decade in history is dramatic, but in an especially dramatic decade um, in, in broader Latin American history. You know, you have um, 1968 in Mexico and the Mexico City Olympics. You have the overthrow of Allende. Um, you have, you know, um, uh, Echeverria trying to become head of the UN and things along those lines. So so how does um, 
Chavez. What what are sort of the political currents of of of, of Venezuela, both um, within the country itself, but also in sort of the pan Latin American sphere? Because as you mentioned, this is something that's very important to Chavez. He learns from Bolivar in his mind, which has this sort of pan Latin American idea. So, can we talk a little bit about the ideological currents that are that are in Venezuela and how Chavez interacts or doesn't interact with them? Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, I mean, the major thing that happens in 1970s Venezuela that has a deep impact not only on Chavez, but also on the region is the oil embargo of 1973, which you know, spiked oil prices massively and really created a, a, a huge windfall of revenue for Venezuela that um, the government at the time, a social democratic government of the person who will later conduct this massacre in 1989 when he returns to the presidency, um, used to spend um, you know, handsomely on all manner of, of, of programs and policies, which really expanded um, the, the role of the state, number one, but also the prestige and the kind of um, gravitas of Venezuela uh, geopolitically. So yes, of course, Echeverria was uh, gunning for the UN, but it was really Perez with his sort of oil checkbook who, um, by way of you know, loans to um, uh, you know, to to smaller countries of, of the region, but also projecting a sense of Venezuela as you know uh, as punching above its weight, tried to bring countries of Latin America and others around the the global South um, around that sort of a new vision or or, or a vision of non alignment with teeth. And of course, this was Alejandro. Just one quick question, um, and forgive my ignorance, but is this a moment where there are different models of sort of who's going to lead Latin America that are vying with each other? Would that be an accurate way to describe it or, or, or no, these are kind of happening independently? Um, I think that sure. And so far as you have currents like, you know, uh, Castrismo and in Cuba, although they, he's not really positioning himself by the, the 1970s as an alternative to the region. Um, you have the military dictatorships of the Southern Cone, which um, were not also seen as kind of alternatives, you know, to some extent. And this is the this is sort of the historians, the Venezuelan historians curse. Venezuela really seems like an exceptional country. Um, during this time, it, it it doesn't seem to fit the the, the larger kind of cross currents of, of the region, um, which are not you know positioning themselves as, as primary major alternatives. But Mexico really does emerge as a kind of challenger, or Venezuela does emerge as a challenger to Mexico's otherwise seeming primacy because of its role, um, uh, you know, the, the size of its economy and its proximity to the United States. And so there is a little bit of that tension, but but in, in a way, I think what Perez in the 1970s perceives is that, um, you know, Venezuela is actually in a much better shape than Mexico was at the time, precisely because of the, the wake of the Tatelolco massacre and the loss of a kind of, you know, revolutionary sort of, um, you know, uh, prestige that, that Mexico had once carried. So it's really a time of opportunity for Venezuela's government um, to position itself as a leader in the region. And Chavez sees this and kind of buys into this somewhat. But then he also realizes, again, as a result of some of his first commands, that um, once you go further into the countryside or parts of the region of Venezuela where the oil money really wasn't flowing, what you had was significant amounts of poverty, of significant amounts of disenfranchisement. And at the same time, it was his brother, Adán Chávez, who actually was a cadre in the more radical um, you know, Marxist, um, some of the more radical Marxist groups. And so it was his brother who basically got him to start to read and to think about alternatives um, to um, social democracy, to reformist militarism. And in fact, so much so that he thought that he would leave the army. Um, and it was only after meeting with some of these you know, Marxist leaders in Venezuela who convinced him that he could have a bigger impact by staying in the military than leaving it that he remained. But at that time, he became now a conspirator in trying to you know, overthrow the, um, the social democratic governments at the time. So um, this raises so many interesting questions. <laughs> um, so when you, you say he was going to leave the army, was that like to become a, a member of a revolutionary group? And then also, you know, m m Marxism can mean many different things. What is the particular ideal? And this is the intellectual historian's question. What Marxism? You know, what, what, are, who, 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 what is the vision, the Marxist vision that is being um, imbibed by Chavez um, in the 70s and the 80s when he's a young man? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, he absolutely wanted to, you know, leave the military to um, join up in some of these cell, you know, guerrilla cells. Um, he had the military training. He thought that he could um, have an impact in in what had really been kind of largely defeated, um, you know, guerrilla insurgency at that time. Um, but in particular, I think what he was drawn to, and this fed into this reformist militarism that I talked about before, was that the variants of Marxism that were uh, most popular, um, so to speak, among radical leftist groups at the time were Marxist-Leninists. Um, and they were in particular in, uh, very much informed by Guevarismo. So these, you know, folkista, you know, we're going to um, try to, you know, create these, these small groups of um, uh, you know, these small bands of cells that are going to be able to jumpstart, especially in the countryside, um, these you know, revolutionary spaces that will then expand and grow and mutate. Um, that was the primary strategy and sort of tactics of the, the Marxists in Venezuela at the time. What is the rural-urban divide in Venezuela at this time? It's significant and growing. And in fact, it's one of the major reasons why the guerrilla movement had been defeated. They opted for a Guevarista strategy just, just at the time when Venezuela was really transforming into a highly urbanized country. Venezuela right. is one of the most urbanized countries. Almost 90, 93% of its population lives in cities. And that number has pretty much stayed around that that amount for about 35, 40 years. Um, and so they were easy to, to find. They were easy to, um, to beat. And they really had no traction in the countryside among the people who they were otherwise trying to, um, uh, you know, to inspire. Um, and at the same time, Chavez understood that that, you know, the, the road to a revolution does not pass through Marxism-Leninism insofar as in Venezuela, Marxism-Leninism eschewed a nationalist vision of Bolivarianism. They, they saw that as kind of base. They saw that as um, uh, strategically and sort of long-term defeatist. They saw that as an as a impediment, basically, to eventual class struggle insofar as Bolivarianism. I mean, Bolivar himself was you know, part of the bourgeoisie. Um, and so, you know, that didn't quite jibe with Chavez. Um, and so that part of it, he, he really dismissed and tried to find some sort of way to bring together these otherwise contradictory currents. So how does Chavez's career proceed over the course of the 80s and into the 1990s? By the 80s, he's um, rising through the ranks, but he's also now bringing together at the same time a group of co-conspirators who are seeing, especially when oil prices begin to plummet in 1982, 1983, and the, the crisis of the petro state now becomes a crisis of a bust, a massive bust. And so you know, poverty you know, rises dramatically. Um, you know, diseases return, um, massive unemployment. I mean, all of these things are playing out in the 1980s, which are really creating the conditions for people like Chavez and those who he's conspiring with um, to see fertile terrain for an insurgency. What they don't do, however, uh, in part inspired by the, the more folkista strategy that um, had been in play in the 1970s, 60s and 70s, was reach out to and collaborate closely with some of these civilian non-military groups. It was very much a militarist um, uh, you know, conspiracy. Um, and that changes to some extent in 1989. That's a real moment of um, uh, of inflection because that's when Beres, who had been president in the 1970s during this period of oil boom, returns to the presidency, um, sweeps in a landslide, and I think in part because people believe that he might bring about the return to the glory days of the 1970s, and he in the campaign said, I will not negotiate with the IMF, I will not bring about austerity, and the first thing that he did was to negotiate with the IMF and bring about a very severe uh, you know, package of economic austerity. Um, that affected most of the population that had been hard hit or hardest hit in the 1980s. And so, you know, when they rose up to protest these policies, um, uh, Perez called on the military, ironically, um, who followed a plan to, um, that, was in, in, uh, that was enacted in the 1960s to defeat urban guerrillas um, back at the time when, when that seemed to be where the greatest challenge to democracy was going to come from. It so happened, one of these coincidences of history, that Chavez was um, in bed with measles. And so his unit, even though it was called to repress some of these protests, he was not part of it. Some of his conspirators were, and they you know, really had to wrestle with that in the years ahead. 
Um, but that really inspired the level of repression, um, you know, upwards of 300 official deaths, you know, 1,500 unofficially after mass graves were discovered um, in Caracas and in other major cities, you know, that really cemented the sense, not only on the part of Chavez and his conspirators, but also on the part of significant sectors of the population that this political project had run its course and something new needed to surface. Um, and that's basically where the inspiration for the coup in 1992 came in. Alejandro, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the kind of broader environment in the 80s, um, outside of the the left, I, I, I'm, I draw some parallels here between the story that you're telling and um, what happened in Iran, uh, which also went through, uh, I think, a more compressed boom and bust cycle because of the oil embargo in the 70s, uh, you know, that led to the revolution in 1979 focused on the Shah because the Shah was sort of this person that everybody could focus their rage on. Uh, but the revolution, once the Shah was out of power, it, it became very clear that uh, it was not one thing. It was There were multiple strains of opposition that had sort of put their differences aside to get rid of this one person that then, uh, you know, kind of branched out. And it was only after that that, that, it, that Khomeini and, and that strain uh, kind of emerged in the best position to, to control what happened next. So, uh, without a figure like that, I imagine there was a, a, a wider array maybe of, um, you know, opposition to the government. And, and I'm curious as to what uh, that looked like in, in Venezuela. Yeah, yes and no. I think that the, the, the kind of animus towards the government was certainly not as high as it was under the Shah in Iran, such as, I, as I'm familiar with it. In fact, what had happened is that the the guerrillas who had tried to stage, um, you know, a series of coups and to take power following a kind of you know Cuban inspired model back in the 1960s and failed in their effort. By the late 1960s, they accepted what um, at the time the Christian Democratic president called a, a process of pacification. Basically, he, he promised them amnesty um, in in return for participating in the political process. And so they created, or many of them who had been demobilized, created a political party called MAS, Movimiento al Socialismo, Movement Towards Socialism, which you know, was certainly far to the left of what the two primary parties, political parties at the time, the Social Democrats and the Christian Democrats were. Um, but they were also, um, you know, they also had these cross-cutting contradictions within them insofar as they had supported a, a more insurgent kind of strategy or, and were now pursuing electoral democracy. You know, they were successful to a large degree in terms of, you know, bringing together intellectual elite, intellectual elites. They were, you know, very popular among college campuses, in college campuses. Um, but what they were never really able to do was to draw significantly from the well of popular sectors in Venezuela, the, the burgeoning masses of people who were being left out of the oil pie who were building, you know, barrios and in, in, in precarious conditions, um, whose, you know, whose purchasing power was not growing apace with the middle classes. Um, and so they were unable really to tap into some of the discontent, which over the years really became more and more detached from the political system writ large. And it, basically to think about it, it was it was more of an available not available, but it was more of a of, of an orphaned mass of, of of people who saw nowhere in the political landscape, whether from the left or um, not so much on the right. There were many significant right wing movements in Venezuela or parties, um, you know, opportunities for for different kind of alignments, different kinds of organizing. Um, and so, what happens basically is by the 1980s, what emerges really is. Um, disorganized, dis, you know, discombobulated civil society groups, some of the middle classes, some of them among popular sectors, that are primarily attending not to ideological concerns, but to sort of bread and, you know, bread and butter daily life issues of, of cost of living, of, um, of inequality, of, um, you know, of rents, et cetera, et cetera. And so a lot of the opposition to the government that begins to form is really more policy specific than it is ideological. And of course, you know, this is going to give rise to what broadly we would later understand to be, you know, the grist for kind of populist politics, right, where, you know, it's not quite attached to any ideological vision. Um, 
that it that it's more rooted in in um, in more everyday concerns, but because of that, allows for greater amounts of people to see themselves in it, right? So, in part, that's what's happening. It is a riven society, but not one that um, that that is so uh, uh, sectarian um, along rigid ideological lines. So that brings us almost naturally to the 1990s. And so what does Chavez's career look like then, particularly his participation in the early 1990s coup? Um, and, and what is going on in, 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 in Venezuela's relationship to the world um, when the Cold War comes to an end? Is that an important moment or not really? Or are there other sort of periodizations we should be focusing on? No, absolutely. I mean, 89 is certainly for, for the world, as we know, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, but in, in, in not just Venezuela, but Latin America, it's, it's a point that I think increasingly we are seeing, by we, I mean, historians of the region, as, as a real moment of inflection, which is to say, you know, by the 1980s, as a result of some of the debt crises that had really afflicted, you know, Mexico certainly in 1982, but other parts of the region which had been increasingly turning towards, you know, the IMF and the World Bank were these high conditionality, deeply austere, you know, economic packages to try to, you know, pay back their loans. The, what was emerging was a real consensus among political and economic elites that neoliberalism was going to be the only game in town. You know, never mind democracy, it was really going to be these new structural adjustment policies that were going to dictate the the, the return of, uh, of 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 Latin America to some sort of kind of stability. Um, and for a while, certainly in the 1980s, that seemed to be the um, you know the only alternative, the only option. And 1989, which is when the uh, these reforms start to be implemented in Venezuela, and then there's this massive opposition to it. That really becomes the clarion call. I mean, certainly we talk about 1994 with the with the Zapatistas, or you know, 2000 or, or, or uh, 1996 with the rise of piqueteros in Argentina, or 2001. Or you know, or 1999 with the you know anti-WTO protests, but it's actually 89 and in Venezuela where the first major nationwide concerted protests against structural adjustment and neoliberalism take hold. Um, and so most of what happens throughout the 1990s is really a kind of you know, free for all in terms of what therefore is a new vision? What can be alternatives to neoliberalism? Um, is it more atomized societies by way of, you know, uh, middle-class sensibility type civil society organizations? Is it more, you know, radical forms of reimagining the state and state society relations? You know, is it, you know, a more kind of savage type of capitalism. What you know, what is what is going to be this new thing that emerges after what had been this crisis of 1989 and the massacre that was ushered? Um, and, and so this is exactly the the milieu basically within which Chavez um, stages his coup in 1992 where he massively miscalculated is that, you know, he didn't really need to do any kind of outreach to the population, that the people themselves would realize that this is something that they wanted. But of course, that what, what this was, was completely unclear. Um, and what Chavez and, and at that time really miscalculated was the extent to which Venezuelans had really deeply internalized electoral democracy, if not its outcomes, as the primary way through which to conduct politics. Um, and so they agreed in principle with the grievances and critiques that Chavez was mounting against the, the, the government, but they disagreed with the methods. And that's really what sort of encouraged them over the next few years after he served two years in jail and was subsequently pardoned. Um, uh, that's what really encouraged them to seek an electoral path to power. It wasn't immediate. Um, it really took a while. You know, between 1994 and, um, and 1996, he traveled throughout the region, met with the PT in Brazil, met with the um, F, uh, FMLN in Central America, met with the FARC in Colombia, you know, went to Cuba, met Castro for the first time, you know, really spanned the continent trying to seek alternatives um, to the neoliberal model. Um, and it was only after that that he returned and um, formed the political party that would eventually lead him to the presidency. So um, for people who might not know about the coup, uh, how did the coup proceed? What were the demands? Um, and, and just like, what, what were the literal events that happened that resulted in Chavez getting imprisoned? And why was he pardoned? <laughs> 
in the wee hours of February 4th of 1992, Chavez, who at the time was um, a commander in the um, army, um, lieutenant colonel, he was in charge of a paratrooper unit. And um, he had conspired with several others in the army, including um, uh, someone who, who would become his right-hand person, who commanded a, um, a unit of tanks out in the central part of the country, and then another one in the western part of the country. And their charge was simple, and it was quite um, definite. We are going to um, take over these various um, uh, parts of the country by making sure that the military in those parts are, are loyal to us. And in Caracas, it's going to be up to Chavez to seize the president, arrest them, um, and then uh, start a new uh, military government, a new junta. Why was he chosen? Was he so charismatic? Did he have the support of the various constituencies? Why him, of all people, to be the centerpiece? Well, in a, in a way, he had been the earliest leader of this conspiracy going back to 1981, 1982. He did, though, have significant amount of charismatic power. Um, but the other real reason, and this is one of kind of the accidents of history, is that he actually, um, he, they very much imagined that he was, as the most senior person in the conspiracy, that he would be ready for the military task of taking power. In, um, in Caracas. And by taking power, I don't mean actually becoming president, but what I mean is being able to seize and detain the president and install a, a junta. Um, what they didn't count on at the time was, oddly, that uh, the you know, because the conspiracy was not significantly widespread in the military, but it, it was broadly known by some actors, um, that there were rumblings within the um, the Bedes administration such that they were slightly prepared for it. Um, and so they didn't really prepare for that part. You know, the, uh, Chavez and his his conspirators didn't prepare for how much Bedes and his people knew. Um, and so that plan was thwarted. But then here's where the important thing is. We sometimes assume uh, and project backwards, right, like the importance of certain you know, later historical figures. The fact is that for all intents and purposes, Chavez's 1992 coup by noon or 11 a.m. In, um, in, in, on February 4th of 1992, we might never have heard from Chavez again, were it not for the fact that he requested a small amount of airtime and, in fact, was granted and was asked of him also to tell the other people in the conspiracy who had been successful elsewhere in the country in staging their strategic goals um, or meeting their strategic goals to lay down their weapons. And as he did so for less than two minutes, it was a 90 second remark, he basically laid out the reasons for why they had engaged in this coup. He laid out um, the, um, the larger vision for a different kind of Venezuela that is more equal, more just for everyone. And most importantly, what he did was he took responsibility for the coup um, and said, this was a Bolivarian movement. I take responsibility for it at a time when no politician took responsibility for any of the shortcomings of democracy. And so what he did in that moment was really become the leader. He, he wasn't, I mean, he was strategically or sort of tactically the leader of the conspiracy, but that's when he became a much larger scale leader for what would follow. So he becomes kind of a celebrity in Venezuela at the time. Very much so. In fact, you know, he um, there's a second coup that happens in in November of 1992. It's a more more it's a bloodier coup. It includes the air force um, as well. There's bombings that take place, um, and he had, from his jail cell had recorded a message, basically, you know, asking people to come out in support of the coup. But again. I think the, the major thing that he miscalculated is as, as popular as he was even after the coup, what he continued to miscalculate was the methods by which a change, a revolutionary change could happen in Venezuela. And I think it was after that moment um, in, in the, the second coup that he realized that, you know, as popular as I am, if people are not coming out um, in these moments, it's because they, they must disagree with something else. Um, this is basically what provided the opportunity for him to um, you know, to see a different path to, to to power, your question about you know how was he pardoned? This is another one of these kind of coincidences of history. 
after Perez um, leaves office, he is uh, after the second coup, he's impeached, he's tried for corruption, serves time in jail. Um, the next person who becomes president is also a former president, somebody who had been um, the Christian first Christian Democrat president in the late 1960s at the time when the guerrillas had been pacified. So he understood this as part of his kind of ideological repertoire, the process of pacification as a, as a kind of a Christian, you know, effort of um, of, of seeking atonement, of of, um, of seeking uh, uh, you know redress. Um, and so his pardoning of Chavez in part was because Chavez is extremely popular, but also it was part of this larger ideology towards um, you know, getting people to think of their differences in a more channeled institutional way or bring about their differences in a channeled institutional way. And of course, what at the time he could not predict, this uh, President Caldera, was that Chavez would be very successful at this, so much so that, of course, he would win the presidency the next time around. At that, by that time, the levels of discontent and detachment, really, between the population of Venezuela and their political leaders had grown so completely um, engulfed that there was no way back from it, and any some, something new had to emerge. So what is this political party, and, and what is the basically ideological content of the Chavez position? Um, how does he come to power, and what are the early years of that, of that power? What do they look like? Chavez builds a coalition that's remarkably um, you know, varied. Certainly, of course, he had those within the military who, and, and, and those from you know, previous guerrilla insurgencies who saw in him this you know, strong, kind of um, you know, charismatic, but ultimately you know, militarist kind of figure who could you know, get things done on the one hand. But of course, he had also inspired significant amounts of the population, including um, youth, including um, you know, certain um, you know, left intellectuals, um, people from the Movimiento Socialismo, the, the, the former demobilized guerrillas from the 1960s who formed this political party in the 1970s. You know, he, he basically became this agglutinizing force um, onto which a lot of different, this is to your point earlier, Derek, a lot of different strands of opposition, um, you know, projected their aspirations for change in Venezuela. Um, and he did so by creating this, what he called Movimiento Quinta República, Fifth Republic Movement, which was a bit of a play on words and what had been the, the conspiratorial um, uh, acronym MBR, um, and this was NVR. Um, so, but, but it was mostly just a, an electoral vehicle to get Chavez to the presidency by actually lacking a significant, you know, significantly specific set of platforms. Instead, he basically built um, that first campaign around two primary promises. One, to write a new constitution in which you know, broad sectors of the population could be um, included. Um, and two, basically to rebuild state capacity after what had been this you know, period of over almost, almost a decade of, um, uh, of, of um, neoliberalization or something like. Well, yeah, all of that. So what ends up happening, of course, is that he is able to bring these various strands together and when he is elected by a landslide in 19, um, 1998 and takes office in 1999, he does so in what he says is that he swears upon a moribund, moribund constitution and immediately calls for a constituent assembly to rewrite the constitution. At the same time, um, he tries to put some teeth back into OPEC the Organization of um, Oil Exporting Countries, which Venezuela had been one of its founding members and really leading kind of um, you know, political forces back when it was founded in 1960, um, and brings together the heads of states of all of um, OPEC countries in Caracas. It's a meeting of this you know, scale hadn't happened for, um, you know, for over a decade. Um, uh, and, and the impetus here, of course, is to try to build up oil prices, which had hit a historic low when he was first elected into office, the price per barrel of oil was $8 per barrel. By the time that um, he was at the height of his political power in 2012, the price per barrel of oil was $150 per barrel, right? So it's a massive boom that's happening during that period. Um, and so he's doing these two things in concert, trying to bring people together in the constituent assembly to rewrite the constitution and create the new kind of social contract for the new Venezuela, while at the same time rebuilding state capacity by creating more revenue windfall that's coming from the state um, oil industry. 
Well, Alejandro, uh, that is a, a great place to stop. Um, and we definitely hope to have you on um, in the future to talk about Chavez's time in power, what he does for Venezuela, um, his stand against the you know, imperialist U.S. behavior um, around the world. Uh, but uh, for now, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, and everyone, check out Alejandro's work over at NACLA um, and also his book, Barrio Rising. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks,